Thank you so much, Buki. So yeah, um, I, I'm hoping that this will be informative because I think that it can be really difficult to tease out high yield information, I think on the internet and then and then certainly even at your doctor's appointments. So Buki introduced me. I am a board certified dermatologist at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and I have a research focus on alopecia in women. And um, I've had the good fortune of having my research supported by a variety of institutions, but I also feel very passionate about educating the general public about hair issues. So this talk, I'm really going to focus mainly on curly hair, um, but certainly I'll take questions on all hair types. When we talk about curly hair, I always like to remind my patients that curly hair has an evolutionary advantage. So if you think about evolving 5,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago in sub-Saharan Africa, where there were no combs, no brushes, no styling tools, no shampoos, no conditioners, well, you would want hair that was low density so that the scalp could cool very easily. You would want it to go grow upwards, not downwards, because no one wants hair on their shoulders when it's really, really hot. So um, in addition to that, you want your hair to break off easily, right? So once it even approximates your shoulders or your neck, you want it to break off without you having to think about it. And if you think about evolving, in a Northern European climate, um, at the same time when there are no combs, brushes, or hair styling tools, you want high density hair that warms the scalp, warms the head, um, and grows very easily past the shoulders with no effort whatsoever. And when we fast forward to 2023 or modern times, we associate long hair with femininity, and this can be very difficult for people with very naturally curly hair because this is not what it's evolutionarily designed to do is grow very easily. It's best suited to be worn straight as you can see the beautiful Lapita Nyong'o has here. Um, and when curly hair is cut short, it actually does a much better job of laying against the scalp unlike those with very straight hair. So this is, this is our evolutionary advantage and, and how it's basically designed to be worn. But what about the, the downsides, right? I, I talked a little bit about that. You can see in these very microscopic images in, in the picture A, you have typical curly hair. Whenever, this is just what happens when curly hair is groomed. So this is not someone who's done something crazy with their hair. This is literally just you know, stroking a comb through it or stroking a brush, it forms a very complex knot that when it breaks apart, as we see in C and D, that break travels up the entire length of the hair sh shaft. And you can see here where the hair shaft is completely broken. We call that a broomstick sign in dermatology. Column B is a classic simple knot of straight hair. You could imagine that someone, if they took a little bit of time, could just untangle that with the end of a comb, but it's it's not the complex knots that we see with curly hair. Um, additionally, because curly hair is so curly, it's very difficult for our natural oils of the scalp called sebum to coat the hair. And sebum actually prevents the hair from getting dry and it helps protect it from breakage. So this is why people with straight hair feel in, um, the need to wash their hair every day because that sebum coats it so easily, it attracts dirt, and you have to wash it off. But with curly hair, because the sebum cannot coat the entire length of each twist and curl of the hair shaft, curly hair feels dry. It does not require daily shampooing or washing. And again, is more prone to breakage. Conditioners are actually chemically formulated to be fake sebum. So that is how we came up with the chemical formulation for sebum. And so if you have curly hair and you, have a sebum pore state, you actually have to apply fake sebum, which we call conditioner almost every day to replace what you're missing. Okay. And the more twists that you have along your hair shaft, the more points of fragility you have. And so we'll talk about that as we keep going. So when we think about curly hairstyling, it's really designed to accomplish one of two things. It's either a going to minimize the frequency of daily grooming. You saw the picture of what happens when curly hair is combed or brushed, or B, it's going to change the curl pattern to allow the hair to be more easily coated by natural oils. And so that's a relaxer, right? So, you know, those are the two things that we see women with curly hair most commonly doing. 
putting it in a braided style of some sort, right? So you don't have to manipulate it daily or changing the curl pattern so it gets more easily moisturized. Um, I wanted to start off with this patient case. This is a professional woman in her 40s. She's coming to me for a second opinion. She's noticed worsening hair loss for several years. She saw a dermatologist who said, okay, well, I'm not sure what's going on. So I'm just, I'm going to biopsy you. And the biopsy came back as permanent scarring alopecia. So her dermatologist said, you know what? It's permanent scarring hair loss. There's nothing you can do to grow permanent scarring, which is true, right? And so they say, what I want to do is I want to give you scalp injections every three months. And if she, when she asks, well, until when they say forever, because that's our approach for scarring alopecia. We say, we just got to keep doing it because we don't want you to get more scar. Um, but this is actually not scarring alopecia. This is a case of very severe breakage called acquired trichorexis nodosa or ATN for short. This is usually in my clinic, at least it's usually a 30 to 40 year old, um, 30 to forties, um, woman with four B to four C plus hair. And I'll, I'll tell you later why I use the term four C plus, um, this is someone who is experiencing breakage. And because of that, um, and because the breakage is so severe and she can't necessarily braid it, maybe at this point she's covering her hair in a wig. Right. And, and she's also maybe dealing with some traction alopecia. So she's like, well, you know what? I already have one form of medical hair loss. Let me not develop a second. So I'm not going to braid. I'm just going to put my hair in a wig. Um, because of its appearance, it can be misdiagnosed. If I have, as I mentioned, and, and these patients are often on top of their health. So this is not someone who doesn't want to do the right thing. They're just misdiagnosed, right? Because they've been misdiagnosed, they stop thinking there's hope. And when you don't think there's hope, well, what's the point of washing, moisturizing, going to a stylist to trim it? And if your hair breakage is that severe, why would you spend hundreds of dollars on a stylist to you know, cut hair that you can't even wear out, right? If you're told your hair loss is permanent, there's nothing you can do. You're just going to, you know, stop taking care of it. So then it worsens. A lot of times these are professional women who have very busy schedules, right? So they already know their hair takes a long time to take care of. And if they're, if, if they have a reason not to take care of it, they're like, that's fine. I could fill that with other things. I have a ton of emails, right? So what do dermatologists know about curly hair? Well, the answer is not that much, right? We actually did a survey, a research study where we surveyed 300 dermatologists and we asked them like, where are you getting your information about hair care from? And about two thirds said that they got it from personal experience. And I know that to be true because I did a dermatology residency as well. And hair care is not a part of dermatologic training. Only 13% said most of what they knew came from their training. So it should be no surprise that overall, female dermatologists felt more confident about their knowledge than male dermatologists, right? Because women, we're, we're trying different shampoos, regardless of our ethnic background, we're trying shampoos and conditioners and hair dyes and, and flat irons, right? So female dermatologists feel more comfortable. And then certainly black dermatologists felt more comfortable than dermatologists of other races counseling patients with a different hair type. So a black dermatologist who will say for the sake of assumption has curly hair says, well, you know what? I, I know enough about straight hair to help, you know, my patients along, but uh, someone with straight hair didn't feel confident that they could help someone with curly hair navigate hair care. Right. But again, remember, this is not even malicious. Everybody's pulling from personal experience. It's not like the black dermatologists are studying this more, they just have more personal experience with braiding their hair or putting a weave in or using a wig, right? Everybody's pulling from personal experience, but if everybody's experience is different, this really leads to huge gaps in care. And so even though hair selling practices can lead to medical disease, few dermatologists feel equipped to address them. This leads to misdiagnosis and overuse of unnecessary medical procedures and intervention because this patient, as I told you, she was misdiagnosed. One visit later, she looked completely different, okay? Um, and she does have some pockets, very small pockets of scarring hair loss, but the majority 
of her hair loss was not due to scarring alopecia. So what does the cycle of hair breakage look, look like? So most commonly, you know, someone notices like, okay, I, I have some hair breakage. My hair's not doing what it used to do. So the first thing they do is say, I'm going to start protective styling, right? They're saying, I'm going to start putting my hair in braids or weaves, or I'm going to start wearing a wig because I just, I do not know what to do with, about my hair. They take out their protective style and they're like, God, it feels even worse. It's breaking off even more than it did before. Okay. Back in the braids. I definitely can't come out of braids now. And they continue to camouflage it. The hair loss gets worse. They take it out, they protect the style and they can never break this cycle. And that's how you get to the picture that I just showed you. So what do you do, right? Natural, relaxed. I mean, you know, what's the choice? Well, this is the ideal, right? There, you can have healthy, natural hair and you can have healthy, relaxed hair. And whatever you choose, everybody's going for the ideal. If you're natural, you're like, I want my, I want my hair to grow to the heavens, right? It's, it's a crown. And then if you're relaxed, you're like, gosh, you know, I want it to be easy to take care of. I want to get some length. I want it to be sleek, right? Everybody has a healthy hair goal, whether they're natural or relaxed, but doesn't always come out like that. So these are the hard truths. So the upsides of natural hair is that one, it's easier to achieve high volume hair. So if your hair is very fine, when you go natural, it's going to, you're going to have the appearance of greater volume. And if chemical free is important to you, you're going to be able to do this in natural hair. I do want to say that hair dye has more chemicals than, than relaxer. I, you know, I didn't go into the science too much of this talk, but to permanently alter your hair, no matter what you do, you have to break a bond in the hair called a disulfide bond that requires a very high alkaline chemical to break the bonds with re when you relax your hair, you kind of stop there. You break the bonds, you manually straighten the hair, and then you use a neutralizing shampoo to stop the chemical reaction. When you color your hair, right? This is someone going from, let's say dark to light. You break the bonds, but then you have to put an acidic agent to kill the melanocytes. Those are the pigment producing cells. So it's a two-step process. So if you're natural and you're like, ah, oh God, I don't want to do any chemicals. I don't like the idea of chemicals on my hair. I would, I would say that the only benefit of chemical free is if you are, you know, not, if your hair is not dyed. So that's how you achieve that benefit is, is natural color, natural hair. Relaxed hair, the upsides of relaxed hair that is that it requires less time and upkeep. And for someone who has the curliest hair type, who says, I've never been able to grow my hair past my shoulders, it's going to be much easier to do that with relaxed hair than when with natural hair. Now, if you're someone who goes from relaxed to natural and you, when you were relaxed, your hair was past your shoulders and you're natural and your hair goes past your shoulders, you're going to have, you're not going to have an issue, whatever you do with your hair. But I'm talking about for people who have a lifelong battle with hair care they're going to find that it's easier to achieve longer lengths and get it past the shoulder with relaxed hair. Now, what are the downsides? Well, with natural hair, it's a commitment, right? It's significant upkeep. And so you need time and you need money because with natural hair, it is a labor intensive process. It's not something that can be managed just by going to, just by outsourcing your hair care, right? So if you're natural, you have to be comfortable washing your hair, moisturizing it multiple times a week. You can't just see someone every two weeks and your hair will remain healthy. Because of this, a lot of my patients with the curliest hair type will start to over rely on extensions because they're like, well, I want to be natural, but when it's natural, I don't know what to do with it. And so they braid and braid and braid and braid. And then they come in with traction alopecia, um, sometimes permanent. And I'll show you that as well. When not taken care of properly, natural breakage in natural hair can be so severe that it exposes the scalp. Downsides of relaxed hair is that um, you get decreased hair volume. You have inherent weakening of the hair shaft to strengthen your hair, that to straighten your hair. That's those disulfide bonds. Those are strong bonds. You weaken them, and then um, you have to be okay with the fact that to start that relaxed hair is not as strong as that natural hair. When not taken care of properly, hair breaks off to the shoulders easily. It doesn't break off to the scalp, but it breaks off to the shoulders. So this is what damaged hair looks like. Damaged natural hair 
exposes your scalp, right? This is that same picture I showed you of that first patient. It breaks off all the way to the scalp. Remember curly hair, it shrinks. That shrinkage means that when you break off what looks like an inch, that might be four inches. So it exposes the scalp very easily. Damaged, relaxed hair just doesn't look good, right? But you're still gonna have hair that's to the shoulders. Sometimes if it's really severe, it might break off to the ears, but it's very rare for relaxed hair to break off so severely that it exposes the scalp, right? So ideal versus reality. Now, who's at greatest risk for this breakage? I don't like the four, the four curl typing system because it is oversimplified, particularly for curly hair types. This is um, an image based off of a research study where scientists went around the world and sampled hair shafts from thousands of patients. And they said, we don't know how many curl types there are, but we are gonna calculate the degree of the curve and we're going to see how many groups we can create. And they realized that hair generally falls into one of eight categories with one being straight and eight being the tightest curled. Hair breakage, severe hair breakage is at highest risk for those with curl patterns six through eight. I want you to notice the top two columns here. In um, African-Americans, the most common curl pattern seen in, in the United States is a type five. That represents 50% of the population. So that population is not necessarily going to be at risk of severe breakage like the pictures that I've shown you. Okay, those, those are somewhere between a six and a seven. In America, type eight is almost non-existent, right? That is the tightest curl pattern. It's very, very rare to see that in um, African-Americans or black Caribbeans, um, which are all the way at the bottom right here. Type seven curl is the most common curl pattern that we see in those of direct African descent. So those who are on the continent or first generation, that type. And type eight is seen in 20% of this population. And so one of the things that I, a lot of my patients who come in with severe breakage, they tend to be like a six, seven or eight. And for my patients who are type eight, one thing that I try to remind them is that it's very, very rare to see their hair type in social media, on YouTube, with influencers who say they have 4C hair, but really have a type have a type six curl pattern, right? And so when I talk to a lot, when I do these talks and I'm talking to a lot of patients, I'm talking about people who don't see their curl patterns on TV ever, right? The girls who say they have 4C hair typically are saying they have 4C hair because their hair, their curl patterns tighter than people they know. It doesn't mean that it's the tightest that exists. Okay. So just keep that in mind. So how does that tie into hairstyling considerations? Well, th this is what I think about when I see patients, right? So if I have someone who's like, God, I want more volume. And yes, I am dedicated to a hair care routine. That's great for anybody, but it is certainly going to be exponentially easier if you have a curl type five, which again is the most common curl type we see in African-Americans or a six. If you are seven or an eight, it is going to be much harder. If you are committed to natural hair and you have a curl type seven or eight, you should try to commit to being extension free. And I say 90% of the time, and that includes wigs because wigs can really dry out the hair. Now, if I have someone who's a curl type seven or eight, they've been natural for years, they're having severe breakage, and they're saying, I can't commit five to seven hours a week on hair care, deep conditioning, leave-in conditioning, then I say you may consider texturizing to get you a curl pattern that is more similar to a five or six. Now, realize when you texturize, you can't mimic, you can't identically mimic a natural curl pattern, right? But you're approximating it. So I say you might texturize and then you still have to put in the work, but it's gonna be easier. You're gonna deep condition and actually feel like your hair stays conditioned from wash to wash. For someone with a curl type five or six who's looking for a protective style, their hair is not prone to dryness. I love crochet braids because they're low tension. For patients who do not have a thinning hairline already. They don't have traction alopecia and they're just like, look, I'm going to Jamaica. I'm going to Carnival. What can I do? Then I say, I would rather you do box braids as long as you don't have traction alopecia, because then you can moisturize the length of your hair three to five times a week while installed. Okay. Um, so I want to wrap up with 
some high yield hair tips. I, I mean, I could seriously talk for hours and hours about hair, but we don't have that time. <laughs> so these are my five tips. Hair washing is essential and it should be done one every one to two weeks. You have to remember that hair is not living tissue. It could break off at any moment. You could be excellent with your hair care for 12 months and never falter. And you have four bad weeks and all everything can break off, okay? You have to wash your hair because it gives you an opportunity to deep condition or moisturize. You have more flexibility on this schedule. If your curl pattern is looser, if you're a four, four or five, or maybe a six, or if you're texturized, relaxed. As, as black women, we, we set this standard of, I go to my stylist every two weeks and my stylist is the only one I walk, only person who washes my hair. That only works if your hair is relaxed. That's why people came up with it in the eighties and nineties when relaxers were really, really popular. In the 2020s, when relaxers not as popular, trying to commit to that every two weeks, someone else washes my hair does not quite work for natural hair. Okay. Um, at the bottom here, my recommendations for leave-in conditioner. Again, if your curl pattern's looser, you're gonna have a little bit of more natural sebum coating it. So you can leave-in condition three to five times a week. If you're on the further end, um, seven or eight curls. Again, seven or eight curls, very, very rare here, but I do know I have a lot of patients who are first-generation immigrants. They either immigrated or their parents immigrated. And if you have those tighter curl patterns then you have to moisturize more frequently. Um, just a quick, um, slide about sulfate-free shampoos. It's really a marketing term, but these are a list of sulfate-free shampoos here. My favorite shampoo ingredients, however, are gentle sulfates. These are, uh, are shampoos that adequately cleanse the hair and prime your hair to receive a conditioner. So these are the ones in green at the bottom here. All right, so here's another patient. I want you guys to appreciate her curl pattern. She's still not an eight, okay? I see eights, but I don't see them often. This is a curl type seven, right? But this curl pattern is already tighter than what most people who are on YouTube who get paid by a lot of these hair products, they say they're 4C. They're, they don't, they're not the 4C that I see, right? But this is a type seven curl. And this is another professional woman. She was diagnosed with the same condition that my first patient was diagnosed with scarring alopecia. She was put on the, the appropriate regimen for that condition, but she was misdiagnosed. She wears a wig every day. You can see her hair's um, broken off of various different lengths. Um, she has not trimmed it. She's a professional woman. She does not go out like this. She wears her hair in a wig and she just wants to know, is there anything I can do for my permanent hair loss? And it's take care of your hair right? Again, are there focal areas where maybe she has some scarring alopecia? Maybe, but a healthy hair routine is critically important. In 1992, patients never came to the clinic like this. Everybody was relaxed, right? And so when their hair would break, and we, I think for those of us who are millennials, we remember what bad breakage from relaxers look like. It didn't look good, but it looked like very kind of scraggly hair. It was super, super thin. You saw little thin strands, but we didn't see this breakage all the way to the scalp. Tip two, your body is aging and so is your hair. Age-related hair thinning is normal. Every part of our body is aging and the, the hair is just, it's not immune. And what happens to our hair is we lose density over time. While we cannot treat age-related volume changes with medications, we can treat areas where the scalp is really visible, where the age-related thinning is so severe that it's starting to cause really a medical um, issue. Please also remember your hair becomes less resilient over time. Everything does. You know, I was joking with one of my, my friends about how like growing up, I never drank water and now like I'm doing my blood work and I'm starting to see the, the downsides of that, right? You just can't get away with treating your body the way you did when you were 15. And I have a lot of patients who will come in and they'll have severe breakage or they'll have traction alopecia. And they'll say, I know it's not the braids. I've been doing braids since I was 15. And I'm like, well, you're 45 now, right? You, you can't eat the same you did at 15. There's no reason to think that you could treat your hair the same. So you have to do more to take care of your hair over time, not less. So this is age-related hair thinning that classifies as, as medical because it is so severe that you can see the scalp. And this is before 
and this is after. So this is what medical treatment can do, but it's not going to change. Let's say if you, if you notice, gosh, you know, I can, I used to only be able to tie my ponytail holder once, you know, and now I can tie it three times that we can't reverse with, with prescription medication, but this severity of thinning we can. And, and this is the same process. It's called pattern thinning. Men get it earlier than women, but you can see this is a 22 year old man from afar. I think if I told y'all to guess his age, many of you guys would guess much older. This is him on the same medication four months later, right? So when it's really, really severe, we can make an impact, but we can't really make much of an impact when it's um, milder. Three, essential oils are medicine too right? I, I have a lot of patients who are like, you know, I don't want to take medicines. I just want to take supplements. Anything that has biological activity has an upside and a downside. If it's doing something, it can do something bad as well. Okay. That is not a unique property of, of medicines. A lot of medicines were discovered, you know, millennia ago, right? And so just really keep that in mind. When it comes to essential oils, rosemary oil probably has the best evidence behind it as far as supporting its use for hair thinning, particularly age-related hair thinning, and then also autoimmune hair loss called alopecia areata. But when you're using an essential oil, it's supposed to go directly on the scalp, not the hair, because it, it can dry out the hair and cause breakage. So if you're looking to use it as a medical treatment, right, to reverse thinning, then you put it on the scalp, not the hair. These are side effects of essential oils. So remember, if it has a biological activity or a biological upside, it has a biological downside as well. So these essential oils can cause pregnancy complications and should not be used if you're pregnant or considering, um, uh, considering that you may become pregnant, peppermint, rosemary, camphor, thyme, um, eucalyptus and camphor have repeatedly been linked to um, first onset seizure, especially in kids. If you have a history of breast cancer or a hormone related malignancy, you want to stay away from lavender and tea tree oil, eucalyptus and peppermint can cause breathing issues in babies and tea tree and balsam of Peru can, um, lead to skin sensitivity Four, hair thinning can be a, a sign of internal disease sometimes. And the reason I say sometimes is because of you know, the pictures that I showed you earlier on in this talk, I see those all the time, right? That's not a rare occurrence for me. And I'll have patients who'll come in and I'll say, well, how often are you washing your hair? And they'll say, oh, like once every three months when I take out my braids and they'll say, are you sure I don't have some disease that's causing my hair loss? Check my iron, check my vitamin D. And I got to tell you, most hair thinning is, is honestly bad luck, aging or hair care, Right. So nine times out of 10, it's not a sign of internal disease, right? Hair is not living tissue. It's like, it's like your nails, right? If you don't take care of your nails and you walk past a wall and you break it, it doesn't mean that something's wrong with you. It just means that trauma got the best of it, right? Stress-related hair loss is common. It's fortunately completely reversible and it's associated with major acute stress like postpartum, um, a postpartum pregnancy state divorce, moving, things like that, a death in the family. So it's not chronic stress, but major acute stress can lead to hair shedding. A loss of curl pattern in black women is really under recognized. It's a very rare finding, but when you see it, it is very specific for autoimmune disease. So conditions like lupus or alopecia areata, very few dermatologists are aware of this. And unfortunately people don't complain about it. So if you think about the board, I just sent you like, think about if you're someone who naturally has a type seven curl and you suddenly have like a type five curl or a type four. I mean, really that's the type of jump that I'm talking about, right? That's not a bad thing. It's easier to moisturize your hair. You know, it's easier to comb through it. People don't complain about it, right? This is what it looks like. This is autoimmune disease. I want you to see how fine this hair is right. Um, it's like baby hair. It's almost like peach fuzz. And a lot of times, you know, this is an extreme version of it, but a lot of times, you know, I can diagnose autoimmune disease just by picking this up. And you can see that when things are treated, the curl pattern starts to come back. Right. So even though she had grown out some length, you see how straight her ends were. Right. But when the curl pattern starts to go back, come back, that's when you know that things are under control. And five, I really implore people to stop extensions at the first line of hair, 
hair, hair thinning. Um, the term protective style is a euphemism at best and a bold faced lie at worst. Okay. My bias is that I am a hair loss specialist and I hate the term protective styles because people are, are saying that. And when you're putting them in, you're thinking this is me doing something good, but realize that, that extensions are a style of convenience and that's okay. If you are super busy, that is a huge upside. I told all my patients, I'm like, look, when I hit third trimester, you guys are going to see me in braids, right? Postpartum, I'm going to be in braids. But I knew that there was a downside to that, right? But I don't want people to, to over rely on extensions thinking that they are protecting when for all of the reasons I've talked about in this talk, they really lead to breakage. Now, there are some people who are absolutely blessed. That's why I had to put it in bold, all caps, and I had to underline it. They have resilient hair and edges and they can wear extensions all day and nothing happens. These are God's favorites. More often than not, these are people who have either very high density hair to begin with. So this is someone with not even normal density, but high density hair and, or they're going to have some, they're going to have a slightly looser curl pattern. Right. But I think the one, I think it's mostly just good fortune in having high density hair, regardless of your curl type that will get you there. But the average person will have worsening, a worsening hairline over time that eventually becomes permanent. This is what it looks like in stage one. All these stage one patients are almost exclusively young women, right? Who you're 17, 18, maybe 24 years old. And you've been wearing extensions. You take out the extensions, you know, like, oh man, my hairline's a little thin. No big deal. If you stop the braids, that hairline will bounce right back. Once you get older, remember I said hair is less resilient and you wear braids and extensions and you've been doing this since, you know, this is your go-to, you're the girl with the braids or you're the girl with the weave or you're the girl with the wig. You get to this point of stage two where the only way your hair will regrow in this area is if you are treated medically, typically with something, uh, a medication called minoxidil. And I showed you some images before and after images of that. But when you're in this stage two, you have to treat these areas for life. It's not that you'll treat it for three months, it'll grow back and you can go right back to what you're doing. Um, those hairs now require constant medical stimulation to grow. It's similar to being diagnosed with something like high blood pressure. Maybe the first couple of times your blood pressure is high, your doctor says diet and exercise, right? That's a, that's akin to saying, take out the braids. But if your blood pressure is not improving, even with diet and exercise, you have to go on a pill. And once you go on a pill, you're on that pill for life. You can't just stop that pill or your blood pressure will skyrocket, right? It's the same thing. Stage three is when you've gotten past this point. You've had that subtle thinning, but you're still braiding. You're still weaving because you just don't know what to do with your hair. At this point, you require hair transplant. That is cosmetic. It costs about $20,000. It's not covered by insurance. Whether you're in stage two or stage three, you have to think very hard about permanently discontinuing extensions. First of all, if you have stage three hair, you cannot afford to pull all that hair out again, because one, you're not going to have another donor site to transplant again. And two, like you're just throwing $20,000 down the drain. If you're at stage two and you continue to braid, you're just going to get to stage three, which is quite expensive. So all hairstyles are not created equally. There are certainly some braided and extension hairstyles that are worse, like micro links, wigs that are glued to the scalp locks, right? People who do well with locks, they're in the God's favorite category. There are definitely women who do phenomenal with locks, more power to them. If you have no issues, keep your locks in. But if you have fragile hair and you are just average, you are a mere mortal and you put sister locks in, it's going to accelerate your progression to stage three traction alopecia. Generally speaking, you don't, you want to avoid any style that's going to stay in place for longer than four weeks. Things that are okay in moderation, removable wigs, where you take off your wig, you're giving it all the moisture TLC at night. You're washing it once a week. That's okay. Crochet braids. If dry hair is not an issue, crochet braids prevent you from really moisturizing the hair like you should, but they don't pull out the hairline, which is nice. Removable ponytail or bun extensions are great. And like I said, bar, bar, box braids are great too if you if traction alopecia is not an issue, just because you can still moisturize your hair. So here are some examples, right? These are some additions that you can add. Here's some crochet braids. 
And then I'll leave you with this. If you have hair thinning, the best thing you can do while you wait for your dermatologist appointment is please get off the internet. <laughs> Number one, avoid WebMD. Stop biotin. It does not help. It does not work. And it'll affect your blood work. If you are anticipating getting blood work at this appointment, all your blood work will be inaccurate if you're on biotin. Okay. Because it affects, um, it affects, uh, um, how the labs are, are run. These labs actually depend on an en enzyme called biotinidase to be accurate. Go ahead and normalize your vitamin D and iron levels if they are low. Not that low iron will cause your hair loss, but sufficient iron levels are necessary for your hair to enter the healthy growing phase of the cycle. And then please optimize your hair care practices. If you're concerned that you might have, we didn't talk about medical other medical forms of alopecia today. This is all about hair care, right? And how hair care can lead to hair loss. But there are certainly many forms, especially the ones that I study of hair loss where people can do everything right and they just have really, really bad luck and misfortune. And you want to make sure that if you think that you could be in that camp, do all the things right so that that doesn't cloud your evaluation. This can save you a biopsy and blood work. So please, please, please do this. So with that, I will leave you with this and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Christo Agud. This is very educational. Thank you for your knowledge. Um, it, was, it was a blessing, thank you. So we have quite a number of questions, about five or six. I'm hoping maybe you can take a minute for each of those questions. Okay. Okay. So the first one is I have hair loss post menopause. Do you have recommendations for care? Yeah. So that's a great question. Post menopause, the most common type of hair loss that we see is that age related hair thinning. And basically what happens with age related hair thinning is that it's not like we're losing hair, but each hair is growing in thinner than it used to. And that's when you start to notice that decreased density. It usually is most apparent either in the middle of your scalp or right at the right and left hairline. And the best treatment for that is minoxidil. So if you have very, if you have an area along the hairline that you're like, okay, this is an area that I, I really want to improve the density, then using like over the counter Rogaine will suffice. Um, I find that for curly hair types, if that thinning is worse in the middle, they tend to do better with minoxidil by mouth. Um, one, it's just hard to apply a topical solution all over the scalp every day. I think it's just easiest to do that by mouth. But even if they don't want to do that by mouth, you can have your dermatologist compound it into an oil or an ointment that is easy to apply in the scalp. So I, I really don't want people to be afraid of Rogaine. One of the, the most common things I hear about Rogaine is people say, well, I hear you have to use that forever. And it's true just because the scalp is skin, right? So if I give you an anti-wrinkle cream, it's assumed that you can't just use that for two weeks and be wrinkle free. That's a lifelong commitment, right? Even if I give you a face wash, you have to do that every single day. Or if I give you an acne cream, because skin cells turn over every two weeks and the scalp is just skin with more hair follicles. So there's nothing that you can do to prevent the fact that you have to treat your scalp for this, you know, condition every day. All right. Thank you for that. The next question says, I have breakage in my edges from traction. It's gotten worse over the years. My nape hair breaks during the winter season. My dermatologist recommended Rogaine for my edges. It's been working, but comes with side effects. She also gives me steroid shots. How can I regrow my edges and nape without medication? Yeah, so it's kind of like the images that I, that I showed earlier. Um, most people, when they come to the dermatologist tend to be neither a stage two or stage three. Um, you can't regrow your hair without medication. I, I typically don't do scalp injections for, for isolated traction alopecia. I think you don't need it. I think Rogaine alone. So if that is helpful to you, that's a lifesaver because injections are super painful, but injections do not grow hair. So um, I do Rogaine alone, but this is why I, I really try to hammer home this point of extensions, right? If, if you're someone who's like, I don't want to do medicine for my hairline, hopefully you're here, 
right? But if you're already here, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do to avoid lifelong medication. And, and it, I think the hard part of, of what I do is that most of my patients are late twenties, thirties, forties, and really to avoid being in stage two, we really have to talk to people when they're 13, 14, 15, because, um, that's the age where we see the most resiliency and the most bounce back. And, and that's, I think, true for many medical conditions that, that younger people just tend to, to bounce back more easily. Thank you once again. Next question. I have a large birthmark on top of my scalp. The color is gray and a different texture and gets dry. What is the best care and treatment options? Uh, I guess I'm not really understanding the question. If the person is willing to come off camera or, you know, unmute your mic, you can. So expand on the question. Okay. Maybe we'll take the next question. Okay. All right. Um, next question. What is the best treatment for damage hair with exposed scalp? Yes. Um, thank you for that question. I, um, I have so much of this information, um, written down one, I would encourage you to check out my free ebook where I have product recommendations and a sample hair, uh, routine. And I also, I think happened on my blog, but certainly my books to start. What I tell people is it's not necessarily the products, it's the process. Most people who have breakage that severe, it's not just like, Hey, tell me what conditioner to use. Like they're just not even, they're not familiar with how to take care of their hair. And, and it's because like this information is not readily available and certainly hasn't been passed down among generations. Because again, historically, like we would have been in climates where we didn't have to care about this. We were okay with our hair breaking off. Right. But Ideally, you want to shampoo your hair every week. That's ideal, right? You want to deep condition with every wash and you want to use a leave-in conditioner three to five times a week. That's the basics of a healthy hair routine. I like, especially in the winter time, glycerin containing leave-in conditioners because glycerin is a humectant. It pulls in moisture. This is, I, I tell people to, to consider old school jerry curl juices jerry curl juice they used to be called like curl activators but this is these are people when they would texturize their hair they were taught that if you want the curl to be as obvious as possible you have to keep your hair super hydrated so people would literally walk around with bottles of moisturizer and it was so culturally acceptable that that's why people had moisturized hair all the time now we in 2023 we don't do that right people don't carry around moisturizer but but that is what's supposed to be done is you're really supposed to moisturize your hair every single day. Some additives that you can consider are protein treatments or hair strengtheners like Olaplex. Like Olaplex is not technically a protein treatener, um, a protein treatment, but it is a hair strengthener. These are things that are meant to be used during the wash day. So either pre-shampoo or post-shampoo to help minimize breakage between um, washes. All right, thank you again. We have about just two minutes for questions, but I see another one coming in. There are some general questions about how to identify your hair type, when to trim your hair, and how to go about choosing a dermatologist. So if you can just answer all in one in like a minute. Yeah, um, you know, I think one of the things that's toughest is really identifying your hair type because, and I actually just put a video on YouTube about this yesterday. Um, about some of what I talked to you guys about today, that you can't really trust other people to help determine your hair type because most people, most, most bloggers that I see call themselves 4C, no matter what their hair looks like, right? And it doesn't really help you figure out if your hair requires more TLC or less. It's not necessarily critically important to know what your hair type is, but it is important to know what your hair requires, right? Because if you are ultimately further down the spectrum, if your hair is 
is very tightly cur curled, you require frequent moisturization. One telltale sign of type seven and type eight curls is that people will say when they deep condition their hair, even if they do an aggressive deep conditioner, by the next day, it doesn't feel like they've done anything at all, right? And that's kind of a sign that you're probably in this type seven, type eight curl. Again, these curl types are not designed to retain moisture because they are programmed to break easily so that they can have a survival advantage, right? And so if you find that your hair is acting that way, just make sure to know that you really cannot, you know, you cannot skimp on the leave-in conditioner every single day because it's just really hard for your hair to hold on to as much, as much moisture as possible. Um, as far as selecting a dermatologist, I think that what the, the reason I give this talk is because I think that to start people should, you should understand your hair care routine as much as possible. Because as I said, like dermatologists, they don't know this isn't there yet. Right. So you have to figure out how you're going to wash your hair, shampoo, condition it. Because if you don't, you might be misdiagnosed, right? Like you really want to eliminate as many variables as possible. Dermatologists are well-trained in scalp disease. Hair breakage is not scalp disease, right? They are well-trained in scalp disease. And if you go to a dermatologist, they are going to use what they know to see if they identify problems with your scalp. But you can't go to your dermatologist to, you know, guide you on your hair care routine. Right. So that, so that is the point I think of trying to empower women to understand what their hair needs and also to not shame women with type eight curls who cannot thrive in a natural state. Right. Uh, I think that sometimes in the natural hair community, people can be shamed when someone might say, well, I have 4C hair and you just have to be on top of your routine. You just have to deep condition and you have to leave in condition. And if you do that, it'll, it'll be fine. And that person's a type six, right? And you're a type eight and you're like, well, come on, I'm doing all that. And I'm not getting the benefit. People have to realize that like, there's a lot more diversity in curl patterns that we are willing to accept within the black community. And that you have to, figure out like what makes the most sense for your life and what's going to make your hair look healthiest. Thank you so much. I know we're out of time, but Christina, is it? Oh, okay. There's just one more question. <laughs> is it okay? Or should we close out Christina? Hi everyone. Yes. So we are, um, we're going to need to close out. You can ask that one question. And then after that, ladies, uh, we're going to transition back to the main room for a networking session. So um, I'll All see right. you over there. All right. Thank you so much. So maybe about 30 minutes, um, 30 seconds to answer this. So this person says, I have psoriasis on my scalp. Is there something other than chemical treatment um, to treat it? She uses tea tree shampoo right now. The only thing about um, tea tree shampoo and shampoos for psoriasis is they break curly hair. So again, hair and scalp are different, right? Psoriasis on the scalp is scalp disease. So a lot of these shampoos, they're effective for psoriasis and they don't really care what happens to your hair. And they are effective only if used daily, right? So think about like, if I gave you, if you have acne and I gave you an acne cream and I was like, okay, use this every day. And then you come back and say, well, I used it once every three weeks. It doesn't work. I would say, well, it's not that it doesn't work. It's just that you're not using it as directed. Most shampoo preparations for psoriasis are for straight hair. They are for hair that can be washed and should be washed every day. It's very rare to like, certainly you can be black and have straight hair, right? Like being black is a very wide term, right? But if you are someone with a tight curl pattern, shampoo is often detrimental. And so really what um, many of us dermatologists do, um, and, and certainly those who are more familiar with curly hair, is recommend the use of anti-inflammatories that can be applied directly to the scalp daily. So creams, ointments, oils, those are going to be the most effective because those are more reasonable to be applied daily as opposed to a shampoo, which really shouldn't be used daily. Thank you so much. 
So that's all the questions we're able to take for today. But once again, thank you so much for this time, for the knowledge, information, and the resources that you provided. So ladies, there should oh, can be- I, Can I, sorry, I'm sorry. For the person who asked the session, who asked the question about psoriasis, since you have straight hair, tea tree is good. Yes, tea tree is effective for, I'm gonna call it seborrheic dermatitis. Psoriasis is, is seborrheic dermatitis is, like mild psoriasis is more severe psoriasis. If it's true psoriasis diagnosed, you have it on the scalp and the body, it's an autoimmune disease. It's not gonna improve with tea tree. If it's just on the scalp, technically we call that seborrheic dermatitis. Tea tree can help, apple cider vinegar can help, um, and topical antifungals can help. So those would be the, the three things that I would recommend if you want to stay away from medicines, but remember tea tree is a medicine, right? It's an essential oil. It has, it has, it is a medicine. It might just be a medicine you're more comfortable with, but, but essential oils are medicines as well. So just keep that in mind. Okay. That was it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know someone mentioned about finding dermatologists. I would confess I've been trying to get in with you actually, and you're booked and busy. So for yeah, me, I'm not accepting patients at the moment. Sorry guys. Okay. I wish, but um, I am very booked out. I think I'm in 2024 now. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So ladies, as soon as you, you know, find that one, just get on this schedule because you never know when they'll be able to get you in. But um, that's all we have for today. Once you exit the meeting, there should be a survey that pops up. Please take that um, survey so we can just gather some feedback on how to improve on the next um, sheet summits. Any last words, um, Dr. Crystal? Nope. Thank you guys so much. Like I said, I have, so, I have so many resources available. So if this made your head spin, <laughs> check my website out. <laughs> so, All right. Thank you. Guys. And we'll see you in the next um, session, ladies. <laughs>